right back. This is Think Tech Hawaii. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Global Connections, where we talk about things happening around the world. And today we're going to talk about how is the war going in southern Gaza. And uh, for this discussion, we have Dr. Uh, Rupmati Kandakar joins us from New York. Uh, welcome to the show, Rupmati. Aloha, Jay, and it's all my pleasure to be back with you, and it's good going in the war and with us as well. So, let's so is this the end of the beginning, or is it the beginning of the end? How, <clears throat> how are we doing on the continuum of this war? Obviously, Israel hasn't quite won the war, but there are mm, hopeful signs that it will uh, not in a not-too-distant future. What are your thoughts? Uh, Jay, right now we see that Israel is progressing well, but there's a lot of, uh, uh, currently the fighting is in uh, Khan Yunis. The fighting has intensified over there. And like you discussed, the tunnels were definitely flooded with salt water. And uh, I think the rats are coming out in that. Um, lots of uh, civilian uh, damage in this uh, war, but I think uh, it was because there were civilian shields, isn't it, Jay? So uh, the blame is all on uh, the Hamas, which uh, used the humans as shields. So, um, and it was such a necessary war, Jay. Uh, almost two months into the war, we see that the overall perspective is that uh, Israel needed to do this. Israel needs to continue this to the end because of the foreseeable attack if left unfinished. That is the main crux in this entire war, Jay. And uh, that is what keeps the uh, IDF going. And uh, this network of tunnels was such a discovery to have a, um, a, a, a double city, a doubled uh, area of the city underneath the city. So uh, you have this kind of uh, um, preparedness by the Hamas, which was there and which caught Israel unawares in this war. And, you know, um, so many things came as a learning point for Israel, Jay, in this um, war that intelligence failure, yes, because uh, nobody expected them to attack on such a force. The terrorist attack to be at such a high level was... Um, unexpected. And the hostage situation, like we saw last time, it was uh, documented for the timing. A few hostages were exchanged, and like your fear has come true, the rest of the hostages are going to be used as, uh, um, you know, it's going to be a sad point, mostly. But, uh, Jay, one story I want to share with you, that there was um, uh, one circulating that two ter two babies around four years and 10 years, they were being sold by Hamas to another terrorist organization. Has this ever happened in the history of mankind that you have hostages sold to another terrorist organization for future negotiations? I mean, this is um, such unprecedented stuff that came out in this uh, uh, war against terrorism for Israel that uh, it cannot fathom how to uh, deal with such a situation. Mm -hmm. this so, so many, you know, it's an asymmetric war. The, the guerrilla warfare that has been going on with this, uh, it is, uh, uh, you know, the guerrilla warfare is raw. Um, it's, um, it doesn't have sophistication, like you said, and Israel has sophistication. But these people have used sophistication in guerrilla warfare. The tunnels which we saw, they were self-equipped rooms, they were labs, they were uh, missile uh, launching uh, sites, they were hostage keeping sites, they were uh, their refugees uh, sites for them, you know, uh, everything and anything. And imagine this was a place where Israel had given them the keys to flourish, to develop, to exist in peace with each other. It was a place zone where they could live side by side, but they misused it. They misused it. Now, today, I mean, for myself personally, when, <laughs> when I remember George Bush has said that I want to bomb them to the Stone Age, he meant that development was not meant for them. He was bombing into the Stone Age. Was, he was, you know, furious with what happened to his citizens, the terror attack that happened. To, every country has the right to do that against a terrorist attack. Because... Uh, loss of human life which is not uh, involved in a 
warlike situation is always unpardonable. And these people came into houses and took hostages, came into houses and killed families, came into houses and, you know, uh, showed their strength. You had rifles in front of citizens. You had people being pulled out of cars and burned. You had people in uh, uh, music festivals picked up. So uh, absolutely no noje. And uh, Israel has shown its strength. And uh, like we always discuss, domestic politics will always continue. But existential crisis has to be resolved instantly. <clears throat> Uh, um, you know, one of the interesting, there's a number of interesting side points on all of this. And we've, we've heard uh, the United Nations and Guterres, uh, you know, call for a ceasefire. Uh, we've heard a lot of people, you know, protesting that the Israelis should stop their, uh, you know, their, their attack on, on Hamas. And what's interesting is, um, you know, the academics and the, the military people uh, the authors, um, the thought leaders of Israel, uh, who are there and in the United States, ask a simple question in return. They say, what, what are the terms of the ceasefire? You just stop? If you just stop, the, you know, the next step is clear. Hamas will attack again. Yes, uh, yes. You know, that will allow them to attack again and again and again. So you have to have terms. So what are the terms? Well, the terms are simple. You take a known terrorist organization that is responsible for atrocities now and and for quite some time, um, and um, you 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 have them surrender. You have them terminated as an organization, and then you have all the hostages returned. And Anthony Blinken said, "If you do that, the war will stop tomorrow." And indeed, <clears throat> that's what the Israelis are saying. That would that would end the war right now. So those people, in, in, including Antonio Guterres in the United Nations and various um, you know, college campuses who say we have to have a ceasefire right now, they don't give you the terms. But the terms are implicit. If you don't have terms, you have a continuation of the terrorism, right? Right. Uh, Jay, in ceasefire in pseudo liberal language means ask Israel to stop. Isn't it? It's not. Ceasefire means mutually agreed terms and conditions. There is no mutual in this. The pseudo liberals just want Israel to give up the war and let Hamas start again. You know, Hamas is such a um, no, exhaustive uh, machinery. It's not a religious movement. It's not a political movement. It's a self sustained terrorist organization which fuels on funding from Iran, from the antagonistic uh, elements against Israel. So they will re-emerge. Ceasefire means a definitive agreement that is not in the foreseeable future because unless there is, unless Hamas ceases to exist, uh, there is no ceasefire, question of ceasefire. Pseudo-liberals and students who want to, uh, you know, um, you know, the flare up this issue that there has to be a ceasefire, Israel has to give up arms. Tell me those people who are stripped uh, uh, for their uh, weapon checking, what a fury there was on news uh, channel. Where was the fury when Israeli citizens were stripped? Yeah. Innocent people. Innocent people. These are people who are hiding out in tunnels. These are men who are hiding in tunnels. Then the Israeli soldiers need to check them. That is, uh, that is not a uh, deliberate thing. That is a routine uh, because of the nature of operating of Hamas, of suicide belts, which they wear. So uh, you can't keep them. Uh, so the kind of double standards that the international media sets up and the international perceptions. And I think it's, it's come to a point when even a discussion of ceasefire has made Israel unapologetic about explaining itself. Israel has been put into the situation of not explaining themselves. Uh, even when in the United Nations, when the resolution was passed to call for uh, Gaza ceasefire, uh, the veto was from the US. But the reason, and uh, UK abstained. So uh, this kind of uh, support for Israel is because of uh, long-standing ties and previous terrorist experience by UK and US. They know they will strike back. And it's a reality of international uh, relations, Jay, that when you forgive 
uh, enemy, it reinforces and it comes it comes back. And uh, okay, for you United States, the enemy is in Afghanistan, the distance. For Israel, the problem is the proximity, the proximity of Gaza to be one house away from you, one fence away from you. So this cannot be left undone. And uh, Jay, the tunnels which were up to Gaza City easily can reach other places. We don't know what is happening in the West Bank as of yet. You know, uh, this is Gaza City, the northern part especially, being uh, combed. But uh, Gaza, uh, the West Bank, uh, the other parts uh, which are there, they are still uh, unknown territory. Jay. And unknown means one, one suicide bomber is enough to blow up a field of uh, soldiers. So uh, they have that kind of, uh, like well, you that's talk why, about That's why that. they ask him to strip down ah. their undershorts. And there was, there was criticism that, uh, you know, this was uh, un unfair and, um, you know, um, um, an atrocity that uh, Israel would make them take their clothes off. But there's a very good reason for it, because they, they come out of hiding and they could be wearing a bomb. And if they you know, detonated the bomb in front of uh, Israeli soldiers, then there would be Israeli casualties. Israel has already lost about 100, 100. Yes. And it's been killed, 100 of their soldiers. So, uh, but, but I wanted to go into something else, too. You know, you and I talked uh, early in the game about um, flooding the tunnels. And yes. I think Israel has done some of that, but, you know, it hasn't really done it ubiquitously. And I'm not sure why. Um, the reasons have been advanced that uh, perhaps it would kill the hostages, it would drown the hostages, um, perhaps it would, um, you know, make the ground unstable and, and buildings on top would fall into it. Um, I, I don't know. I don't think there are any really good reasons not to flood the tunnels. And, and if you ask me today whether I would refine the suggestion you and I made um, back uh, very early in October, um, I would flood them halfway, because that would be enough, you know, to uh, to make the tunnels non-functional and uh, and maybe corrode the ammunition and weapons down there and, and make the uh, Hamas uh, militants uh, leave the tunnels where the Israelis could pick them up. But what you know, what is very interesting about the tunnels is a video made by Deutsche Welle about the tunnels in the south uh, at the border with Egypt. And they interviewed a bunch of Palestinian kids who had really nothing to do. They hated school. They would cut classes. They would walk out of classes. They did not want any education whatsoever. What they did instead is with their occupation. And these are kids that are 10, 11, 12, 13 years old. What do they do? They work on the tunnels across the Egyptian border. <clears throat> and they're paid. They're paid by organizations that want to build these tunnels, probably Hamas, and that's the only job they can get. And they do that for every day, every night, and they keep doing it, and they've been doing it for years. This is a long-term project, and the expectation they have is they will continue to doing it for years. So it's first it started with smuggling, and then smuggling weapons and ammunition. What I find interesting, though, is that these kids, these Palestinians, they're, they're not Hamas necessarily. They're just tunnel workers. It's an yes. occupation. It's what's been going on all through Gaza for all these years. And that's how we have this, you know, enormous metro of tunnels all over, all over Gaza. It's these kids who were hired at, you know, a few shekels to spend all day and all night digging them out. It's not easy to do that. But I, I think that has to be mentioned. Uh, they didn't get there because the militants dug them. Uh, they got there because these these kids needed some money. The other aspect of the money, and I think it's worth mentioning this too, is that uh, prior to October 7th, some 19,000 um, Palestinians, probably uh, mixed with Hamas, well, had jobs in southern Israel. They would come out and work. And they would they would help the the, uh, the Jewish settlements. And they would be in the Jewish settlements, and they'd be making notes and taking back, uh, you know, information to Hamas about who was where and where was what, uh, and and uh, opening possibilities for the attack. And what I find interesting is that uh, the the revelation now that when the attack took place, 
There were Palestinians who had been working in Israel, guiding the militants who were doing the killing. They were there helping the militants. It's very troubling. Right now, Israel has stopped all of that. There are 19,000 people are not employed anymore and are not likely to be employed until this war is over. Furthermore, there are many, many, many times that number who were employed in Israel from the West Bank. And that has also stopped. And there is, you know, a debate going on within Israeli government as to whether they should ever be permitted back uh, to go to their jobs in, you know, in, in Israel, in Israel from the West Bank. So this has not only affected the economy of Israel, it has affected the economy of all the people, many, many, many thousands who had jobs from the West Bank and from uh, Gaza into Israel. I find that the damage is done. It's another example of of Hamas not really giving a damn about how the no. Palestinians are treated. And right now we find that um, there are rockets going off from the humanitarian site that Israel has defined. I find that extraordinary. Um, mm. Just the way they were going off from, you know, schools and hospitals uh, and playgrounds and the like. Furthermore, the Hamas fighters in the, in the South now are not wearing uniforms. They have uniforms, we know they do, but they're wearing civilian clothing. So it makes it all the more difficult for the Israeli, the IDF to find them and deal with them. I find that, I find that's just another, you know, example of a uh, you know, human shield. Um, and finally, one more point, and, and that is uh, that um, they are, um, they are fighting from residences. And, and Israel knew, we all knew that this would be street fighting, building to building, room to room. And so it makes it all the more difficult for the IDF to go through a neighborhood knowing that there are Hamas people in civilian clothes anywhere and everywhere in every residential section. Um, and that's part of the difficulty in taking over the, the south part of Gaza. Yeah, Jay, I mean, uh, this war has been extraordinary. This uh, entire operation has been extraordinary because of the uh, themselves, they have put the civilian shields in front. And the civilians themselves are that kind of, uh, those kind of people who are willing to give their lives to shield these people. If you tell me, if there's a big question, if, it is, if the Hamas was hiding in Israel, would IDF would have used the same strategy in as they have used in Gaza City? And my answer to that is a definitive yes, because Israel army gave them 20 days to evacuate. They gave pamphlets, they gave warnings for civilians to evacuate the area. They want to carry out Hamas um, elimination operation. If these pamphlets and these warnings were given in the area of Israel, that we want to carry out uh, Hamas, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, combing operation, please evacuate. I am sure, I am definitive that the Israeli citizens would have uh, evacuated the area. There was a big problem when the Hamas, uh, uh, when the Palestinian civilians do not want to evacuate. That's the collateral damage that happened. The... Uh, the shafts of the tunnels entering uh, from uh, houses, from hospitals, from schools, and people knowing about it, but still keeping quiet. This is what is the uh, Palestine uh, mentality right now, just to go against Israel. Doesn't matter what is in front of you. The point is you have to be against Israel. So if this same operation was carried out in Israel and citizens were asked to evacuate, citizens would have evacuated. They have. Uh, yeah, they the would northern have. border and the southern border also. Correct. Nobody would have said, no, we want to stay here only. We want the bombs to come and then we will cry about how much citizens, how much collateral damage and how many uh, uh, innocent civilians you have killed. They were not, not a single civilian is innocent because all of them knew what they are facing. They were given enough warnings to say, come out. Imagine a terrorist organization being given a forewarning, <clears throat> please evacuate. How many Hamas fighters would have run away? And a, a, a big takeaway in this war is the number of Palestine, uh, of Hamas intelligence uh, 
militants, uh, we have these people who will give us information now about how Hamas operates. They are they're surrendering to the IDF. And that is a treasure cove of the operatives because you kind of now have a um, mass understanding of their mentality, of the way they operate. You know, that was mis generally missing. We had one or two people who would go undercover and, you know, you would have double agents and you would have, uh, you know, people who would try to give some information. But now there is a mass uh, uh, you know, intelligence source that Israel has got. And the more that Israel finds and delves into this, you find that the operatives have been uh, aiming for not a minimum damage. They want maximum damage to eliminate and wipe out Israel. So each Hamas terrorist is indoctrinated, like you said. Children, children are involved in Hamas for a, <clears throat> a very strong point. Indoctrinated from concerts to working for uh, like you, you like you mentioned, for their school money, for their uh, chores, everything is uh, you know connected with Hamas. So this is mentality. You we spoke about the dimensions. They have a very uh, multi dimensional uh, uh, outlook towards Hamas, but Hamas has a single outlook, single dimensional uh, target towards Israel. You know, one of the most interesting side points of this is uh, an article that appeared a, a couple of days ago about the extraordinary uh, short sell of Israeli stocks. Um, in the week before October 7th, um, yes. somebody was selling, short selling Israeli stocks, a huge number, an unprecedented number, an extraordinary number of these stocks were being sold on the stock markets. Okay, and what was that about? Somebody made a lot of money short selling because, you know, after October 7th, the, all those stocks went down. So the short sell was profitable. Uh, furthermore, you know, of course, the massacre did great damage uh, to the Israeli stocks and stock market and companies and, and the economy. And you say to yourself, this is an asymmetrical war. You you have the you have the war with the massacre. You have the war with these guys not in not in uniform, shooting from every apartment in every building. Um, but you also have these these external things. You have the propaganda, and now we find that somebody was short selling in the stock market, trying to make a buck on atrocities. And to me, that's a new kind of war altogether. You talk about unprecedented things. That is unprecedented. Um, they made some money killing children. It's 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 unbelievable. Anyway, uh, <clears throat> I also wanted to, you know, dwell on the fact that whether we're at the end of the beginning or the beginning of the end, um, in fact, the Israeli brain trust is trying to figure out the day after. And given, you know, the kind of engagement they've had with the world community and all the criticism, undeserved criticism about their, um, about, you know, their attack or counterattack on Hamas, um, they're trying to develop uh, a, a day after strategy. And it probably will be with due regard for what kind of international reaction uh, will come out of it. So I don't think the Israelis are simply going to occupy Hamas or occupy Gaza. They're going to organize some kind of governmental arrangement there. And they're going to spend billions of shekels uh, trying to figure out how to rebuild the place in a way um, that is democratic. That's a long shot, but somehow democratic, uh, and which allows the uh, Israelis to live in relative peace on the border, and and where Hamas is not there, and this notion of from the uh, you know river to the sea is no longer their guiding principle. <clears throat> but what I think is uh, the day after is something being considered, and it is an important concept because it it will hopefully resolve these problems um, about um, you know. Uh, the Palestinians living only to be victims, living only to kill Jews. 
um, it will perhaps create a more civilized society, a, a civil society. Um, <clears throat> by the way, there's a uh, there's a uh, uh, there's a video series coming out on YouTube in a few days um, by an Israeli author called uh, Zionism and Anti-Zionism, and it's a study of the last hundred years of oh. anti-Zionism. And I think we all have to watch it. It's about, she's very learned. And uh, I think uh, her name is Hilf, H-A-L-F, H-I-L-F. Um, and Ehat, E-I-H-A-T, Hilf. Um, and I think uh, this is going to be very interesting. So uh, that put it on your calendar to watch that, okay, Rupmati, and we can talk about it after it airs. Yes. Anyway, you were saying, what about the day after? Yeah, Jay, uh, the, the day after is going to be uh, positive for Israel, I hope. Now, uh, coming back to your uh, short selling of stocks, that was a dramatic development. So somebody knew that this was going to happen. And uh, the uh, Hamas, as a terrorist organization, they go into this kind of funding, Jay, where they uh, draw income out of these sources for uh, now stock market and uh, you know, they knew how to play it. They, maybe the Hamas uh, leadership knew that they are going to, this attack was coming. So this kind of millions and millions made on the stock market was uh, troublesome, Jay, because if something like this was happening, it is an indicator for, uh, it is a huge indicator for uh, intelligence to look upon and to study before they take it upon themselves. And um, now, Jay, to coming back to this beginning of the end or end of the beginning, uh, Jay, Hamas is a terrorist organization which is uh, destined to go up to their end and each person's end and Israel's end. So uh, this continues because even a single person, now how many were the founding fathers of uh, Hamas? So those few can start it again. The end, um, Take it as a study or take it as research for all time that when Hamas is banned, they will come under another name. They will come under with another identity. These same people will regroup. Even if one or two rats are remaining somewhere, they will regroup, reinforce and re-establish uh, themselves. Not as powerful as Hamas right now, but in, eventually Hamas took 30, uh, three, four decades to establish. They will also take uh, three, four, you know, they will change the name. There was a big problem for terrorist organizations the moment they were banned in the international list. They used to change the name so that they could start a new account, new, this kind of terror financing which takes place. It requires a very comprehensive international strategy. In, and in geopolitics, it requires international support. So that kind of a comprehensive perspective towards uh, uh, terror financing will stop terrorists. Iran made $100 billion when they started trading after the Russia-Ukraine war. Uh, Israel-Hamas war is a direct repercussion of what happened after the Ukraine war. When Iran was under sanctions, they did not have money to eat. <laughs> now, after the $100 billion trade, they had money to fund Hamas. That is the difference, Jay. One war makes on the other. The impact that they have uh, on another war is this that once these countries, which were literally living uh, hand to mouth, had money to distribute, they don't distribute for more development. They distribute for terror activities. And when they funded uh, Hamas to carry out this terrorist attack, you see, this is the terror link. This is the terror trail. This is the money trail that moves. So, and uh, uh, this moves to kill. So. Jay, this finance in um, terrorism that we talk about is very important to trace it, to trace it and to stop it, to stop the channels which fund it. And uh, Israel has to, uh, like I always say, it has six antagonistic nations against it. It's right in between. It's the only democracy in the Middle East. It's valuable. And uh, the numbers of, uh, you know, you have. Uh, numerous articles comparing Hitler to Netanyahu. No, it's wrong. He's fighting a, a movement against terrorism, terrorism against his own country. It's terrorism, Jay, and it is so rampant. 
and i mean they forget the shock of uh, um, october 7th it's deplorable that they think that you know this war should end with israel laying down arms this war will only end when hamas is finished yeah. it's a it's an existential threat for the state of israel for sure Dude, and and you talk about the you know the finance end of things it's really important that the united states maintain its financial yes. support of israel because it's a war of attrition in many ways and uh, if uh, the United States does not uh, maintain its funding, and right now that seems to be stuck, uh, thanks to yeah. an, an ineffective Congress, um, that's very troublesome. Um, I'm glad that uh, Joe Biden continues to support it, it even though it, you know it may cost him politically. I'm glad mm. that uh, he is sending uh, 13,000 rounds of tank ammunition. Uh, to them, uh, as he as he can with, without congressional funding, um, but over time this is going to be a constraint. And really, we need the United States to step up because, as you as you say, other countries, other rogue countries, are providing funding uh, for yes. Hamas. Uh, we can't yes. let that happen and stand by. Uh, Israel Israel needs to have at least as much funding. Uh, and uh, to keep up uh, the war. But let me go to another question, though, Rubati, and we need to talk about this. There's of an course. escalation of the violence on the northern border, on the Lebanese border, um, and uh, this is troubling because it, it draws, draws off uh, Israeli resources and troops and all that, uh, and it's, it's getting hotter on the Lebanese border. Um, what is going on there, and how does that affect the the beginning of the end of the war in, in, in Gaza. Yeah. Jay, Lebanon um, will come in because of uh, Hezbollah. Hezbollah is also funded by Iran. And uh, Hezbollah is, um, Hezbollah would have come in a much stronger way in this uh, fight if uh, Joe Biden had not sent the warships on alert immediately. And we know Joe Biden is involved in uh, Middle East Israel politics since 1973. He's a he's a learned man, experienced person, and uh, a very strong statesman who sends the right signals, right time. You know he's been there, so he's done good. And uh, this Lebanese border, the Hezbollah factor, which uh, in this Hezbollah is a much stronger faction, much stronger uh, terrorist organization than Hamas, but they don't want to involve themselves themselves directly in this war because Hamas is really facing its end right now. And uh, they are giving up like rats because uh, Jay, they had this burst of uh, uh, energy. They did it just for uh, Israel retaliation. They wanted to evoke a retaliation. They got it. They wanted the hostages. They got it. They got to know what they can do with the hostages. It was like kind of a rehearsal that they wanted to do. How can they play and negotiate with hostages? And when they are seeing, you know, Israel had to put this restraint on going all out to rescue hostages because the entire terror cells were watching. If Israel had given in to demands of, for the hostages, you know what kind of implications there would have been all over the world? They would have picked up Israeli citizens as hostages anywhere, anywhere in Israel that start negotiation. This kind of muted uh, uh, response that the IDF is given is very deliberate, Jay, because uh, it will be a cost of, uh, sad that it will be a cost of 200 plus hostages, but it is for the future because otherwise every street, every school, every bus, every walk of every Israeli will be threatened with an impending hostage situation. Mm. Because like we know, they had this kind of... Uh, looking forward to what they can do with 200 hostages because they saw Iran deal with five or six hostages. They were very keen on this. Uh, yeah, but God, it reminded me of an incident that took place uh, uh, in the West Bank only a few days ago where these yes, guys yes. drove a car into a, into a market mm -hmm. and a bus station and just shot people uh, without any cause, without any warning. Uh, mm -hmm. So so you, you have a kind of... Uh, you know, uh, spreading of the violence. Mm. 
um, through Hamas and uh, and the Palestinian community, I guess. But I, I wanted to I wanted to go to one other thing that um, you know you you touched on, and that is um, so we have we have this global affair. We have this risk um, for Israelis everywhere, um, yes. and and we have a sort of people arithmetic we should take a look at. And the Israelis have come out in no uncertain terms to point out that the um, the Hamas. Ministry of Health is a phony. Uh, there's nothing going on with health in, in Gaza. Uh, all these guys that do publish these figures that are wrong um, and uh, try to excite world opinion, it's propaganda, but it's not data in any way. Uh, so, and they claim now there's 15,000 Palestinians who have been killed, and, and they come out with this flat statement. Israel denies it and points out that they're not to be believed. Um, at the same time, Israel has said that they have killed 7,000 yes. Hamas fighters. So, mm -hmm. And the Hamas fighters are embedded in the Palestinian population. So you don't know whether the 15,000 number is right, assuming for a moment that the Israelis are more credible and that 7,000 fighters have been killed. Um, mm -hmm. The question is, uh, how many of those should be deducted from whatever amount of Palestinians are reported by the <clears throat> Ministry, quote, of health, end quote. Um, that's, you know, to me, that's a rhetorical question. The other, the other point is this guy, Sinwar, the leader, the organizer, the founder of the attack, he was, a, he was in a, a, an Israeli jail. He was traded for that one soldier where they traded a thousand prisoners. God, you know, I don't think they should have done that. A thousand prisoners for this one Israeli soldier. And he came back and Look what happened. Uh, he was an activated militant, an activated terrorist. And so they're looking for him. Um, they're looking for him in the tunnels. They believe he's still in, in uh, Gaza. If they find him, they're going to either kill him or try him for the world to see. Uh, not clear. And others, there's two or three others that were up there with him in the leadership uh, that organized the uh, massacre. So my question to you is, um, you know, uh, are they going to find him? Uh, are they going to, what are they going to do with him when they find him? And are they going to be able to find the other leaders of the massacre? Or are these guys all going to scuttle around and, and get away through the tunnel system um, and go across, go across the Egyptian border and somehow you know, reunite with their terrorist friends elsewhere. What do you think? Yeah, Jay, that is a big possibility that they must have run out also. This Yaya Sinwar was uh, one who was exchanged for prisoners, like you said. That's why this hostage situation was so difficult to deal with. We They did not know who to deal with, uh, who to exchange. And they put their foot down on uh, no men being exchanged. Because uh, uh, Israeli man coming back, but uh, uh, murderer and a uh, uh, future terrorist being released was far too uh, difficult to handle right now. And uh, Jay, this uh, Yaya Sinwar was uh, is a very dangerous person because he plans and plots. He is kind of the mastermind of this Hamas uh, attack, terrorist attack. And the numbers that they are playing with, uh, that 15,000, all that, 7,000, uh, 5,000 plus uh, paragliders and uh, Terrorists uh, entered Israel on that day. Did they count those numbers? And how many did they kill? Those numbers are still, uh, you know, uh, blurry. And they give out every day they have these uh, tickers which go on how many lives are going off. It's not a countdown to your new year. <laughs> it is It is an operation which is, uh, and you know, that was a terrorist. In a single day, those were killed. In two months, with extreme uh, caution, with extreme Reiki, with extreme warnings to citizens to flee and to escape and to evacuate the area. Two months is the time that Israel has taken to catch these Hamas terrorists and civilian shields who have knowingly, I say knowingly very well because Israel has given 20 days of warning to evacuate. That is has to be underscored in such a way because Jay, those citizens stayed back. Those citizens stayed back to shield. 
And it well, can't be unwind. There are threats involved. I mean, for yes. example, there's this footage of um, the terrorists stealing um, the humanitarian food and supplies. I right. guess it's drone footage, and it shows that the terrorists are beating up and, I don't know, maybe shooting uh, the Palestinians in order to get the, the food and supplies. They're taking right. what the United Nations and others are providing to help the Palestinian people. They're physically taking it with violence. Um, you know, the other, as I mentioned earlier, is that we have these defined areas uh, for, you know, the Palestinians to go to, and rockets are coming out of those areas. Um, even within the last couple of days, dozens of rockets are coming into the south of Israel and toward Tel Aviv uh, from areas that are supposed to be sanctuary for the Palestinians. What do they expect the Israelis to do? Nothing. Jay, uh, to look forward to in, in this Israel-Hamas war is to look forward to uh, uh, getting close to the end of Hamas as a terrorist organization as and one of the main political uh, players in the Gaza region. And uh, Jay, this, I, I say that the Hamas-Israel uh, war was, uh, Hamas terrorist attack was a direct repercussion of the Russian-Ukraine war. And that was uh, because this kind of money that was pumped in, the terror financing, got these people to uh, come back into the main circuit and be able to launch such a terrorist attack. And Hamas has to uh, disintegrate and be dismissed because this kind of uh, terrorist attack in the future can never ever be uh, expected. And, you know, um what is that you cannot uh, you cannot help that this should happen again in any which way in any small way financing intelligence everything you know to reveal what hamas has done and the israelis are doing that you know they're mm, they're they're making more mm, public relations communications uh, from the families of the hostages, about the hostages. And by the way, I, I don't think we're going to see any more hostages in the near term. Uh, we, may no. have lost, we may have lost them all. I think people are coming around. The fear is true. Yeah. But, um, you know, the Israelis are becoming more, what do you call it, public about some of the things they were reluctant to discuss before, like the details of the, of the terror. Um, and as that happens... Uh, and assuming that the Israelis do lean out and terminate Hamas and its leadership, it's a message to the whole world, something along the lines that terrorism and atrocities don't really pay. And we're not yes. going to let that happen. And, uh, and on the other side of the coin, if is, is Israel doesn't do that, is not permitted to do that, um, you know, either because of political pressures in the U.S. or or in the EU, and for some reason, Israel cannot conclude this war on the terms that are appropriate, that is, the elimination of Hamas, that's also going to be a message to the world, isn't it? And it's going to be something like, yeah, terrorism does pay, we might as well mm. try it here. So yeah, I think yeah. this is really of global import, don't you? Yes, yes, Jay, such a, such a such a valid point. I mean, in international relations today, in, in this is the main main thing because so many terror cells are on the watch, and that is such a uh, undermined fact in this war because everybody has eyes on this war. There is a hostage situation. There is how the uh, secure uh, nation is dealing with it. Uh, how the Hamas is operating, uh, the intelligence that was involved, and uh, terror cells. Now, if Israel does, uh, deals with this, and it will continue for some time, but the terror cells that will get activated, these migrants which will move out to other countries, are not going to be waiting ducks, Jay. They are going to be active people. They are going to uh, want, you know, they are going to have those, uh, um, what is that? Uh, film style, movie style revenge uh, in them and they want to come back and Rambo style uh, take, uh, you know, revenge of their ancestors. Their ancestors came 
to as a ter- as a terrorist that has to be told to them they have been indoctrinated to believe that hamas is uh, heroic hamas is uh, you know this is very uh, uh, virtual like we call it the propaganda war everything is created in this uh, terrorist uh, and, uh, organization they uh, they glorify the uh, fact of uh, you know sacrifice martyrdom they call it jay martyrdom they go to deaths like dogs but they'll call it martyrdom and uh, that kind of uh, mental indoctrination is what is dangerous for every freedom loving democratic citizen all over the world because two of them one of them is enough to create a nuisance for a democratic setup if your yeah. democratic setup is your street if your democratic setup is in your uh, city or if your democratic setup is in your country these people are dangerous because they enjoy the values of democracy jay but they hurt the very foundation of democracy every time you know up to the massacre the average israeli did not have a gun they relied yeah. on on the military to take mm-hmm. care of them and in fact military people always traveling around with their rifles you know on the street corners uh, in the shops what not but now uh, people in israel are getting gun permits and they're getting guns and in fact yes. i i read that uh, there are hundreds of thousands of new guns in the hands of civilians uh, in israel uh, to defend themselves they're not going to let this happen again they're not going to let atrocities happen again they're not going to sit around and wait for the united nations uh, which isn't going to do anything or the international court to deal with it as war crimes um that's going to shoot them and in fact <clears throat> that's what happened in this uh, shooting i mentioned at the bus stop uh right after the terrorists shot the people at the bus stop and they they killed three or four people um some fellow came out or a couple of guys came out with their own guns civilians and shot the terrorists dead right there on the spot finish and it, i think we're, we're going to see more of that and and actually that's a lot easier than waiting for years to investigate and prosecute it's sad that we don't have an agency either for the uh, the the war crimes in Ukraine uh, or in Israel uh, for any international organization to step in and a condemn which the United Nations has not done and b organize a war crimes trial. So I think um, it changes things and maybe not for the best on a, on a macro scale, but it changes things as to what happens if you want to be a terrorist in a in a city or. Uh, uh, you know, in a in a in a setting where you kill civilians, well, civilians can kill you too. Anyway, yeah. thank you very much, Rupati, Rupati Kandakar. Thank you for joining me on this discussion. We'll come back and discuss it further because it's a it's an ongoing yes. story. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me, Jay. Aloha. <laughs>